It is good to be here with y'all. Um, very thankful to be able to worship with you this morning. We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17, and in just a moment, we're going to read through verses uh, 8 through 24. But first, I wanted to set up a, a little bit of the context. I'm sure many of you here know what was going on during this time. We see that the kingdom is divided. And so, so God's kingdom is divided. And the people had asked for a king way back. And we see as we read through Kings that one king after the next came to the people. And they were ungodly. Instead of leading the people to God, leading people to worship God and turn away from evil, they were actually leading people into idol worship. Leading people away from God. One ungodly king after the next. And you get to the end of 1 Kings chapter 16, and we see that Ahab is reigning in the northern kingdom. And Ahab had done more than all the kings before him to provoke God to anger. It says, Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all that were before him. See, he not only worshipped this false god Baal, but he had set up a temple amongst the people to worship Baal. Setting up state-sanctioned Baal worship. We know he married Jezebel, whose father was this Sidonian king, and they worshipped Baal back in their hometown. And so this is the setting, a very grim spiritual setting for the people of God. But we're going to see in our passage today that in the goodness and loving kindness of God, He calls His prophet Elijah to the scene. And we don't get any family history of Elijah. We don't get this long list of credentials. We get a name. His name means, My God is Yahweh. And here He comes to this ungodly king. He's on the scene. He's he's here to let Ahab and the people know that Yahweh is Lord. There is no other God. And so after a brief encounter with Ahab, Elijah, he promises a drought. And if you go back and you read in Deuteronomy and you see the promise of of these covenant curses, if if you were going to partake in idol worship in the land, expect a drought. And so this prophet came as the covenant prosecutor to tell the people the drought is here. And then God, after this encounter with Ahab, to let him know that this drought is coming, God tells Elijah to go to the Cherith Ravine and go drink from the brook and be fed by the ravens. That sounds crazy. If God told us to go go drink from the creek down there and and, and the birds are going to feed you. But Elijah, he goes. Right? He goes down there. And let's pick up in verse 8 and follow along with me in your copy of God's Word. 1 Kings 17, verse 8. We're going to read through 24. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward make some something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. 
The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that He spoke by Elijah. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and he carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and he laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and he cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah and the life of the child came into him again and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's pray. God, this is such a good word. Thank you for it. Thank you for um, the hope that we receive from this word. Please help us today. Help me to preach your word. Show us Christ this morning and help us to worship In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we see that the prophet, he has come to the king, the the wicked king, and he has let him know the drought is coming. And then the Lord sends Elijah on this mission. He sends him into this unlikely place to receive sustenance. Sending him to the creek. Sending the birds to him. And then, and then here we get, he just sends him down deeper into Sidon, to Zarephath, to receive sustenance from a destitute widow. And so what I think God wants us to see this morning in this passage is that He is the Lord. Yahweh is the Lord. And that this Lord, He provides for His servants. This Lord, He pursues sinners. And this Lord, He, he visits, He comes near to His people. And so we're going to see it first here. The Lord provides for His servant and servants. We see here from this passage that these people, they were worshiping Baal and they believed Baal to be the storm god, the one who would provide rain for the crops. And they also believed that He was the fertility god, that He would provide fruit for the womb. But we see here, and we know from our own lives, that Baal is impotent, has no power. And this is what idols do. Idols cannot give us anything. Idols, they take from us. They take our time. They take our money. They take our blood, our sweat, our tears, our children, and they even attempt to take our own lives. But the Lord... He provides. He provides for you. He provides for us. We already saw this in the scene at the Cherith Ravine where the the Lord over all creation providentially provides Elijah food from the beak of a bird. And then He sends him to Zarephath. And this word Zarephath that we read here in the text, it means the refinery. If you go look up the meaning of that town, it's called the refinery or the smelting place. The Lord is sending Elijah into the testing place to burn away the dross of unbelief, to burn away the dross of self-reliance. He's sending His prophet there. And as I've already said, if you thought Samaria, if you thought the northern kingdom was bad, uh, in regards to Baal worship. I mean, Ahab set up this, this temple to Baal, this altar to Baal. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's sending Elijah here into Zarephath, into Sidon, Baal Central Station. I mean, I think it, when I think of it in our times, I think of it, he's sending an old country boy from Saltillo up to Portland, Oregon. 
And look, I, I say that just to kind of get a, a picture of what's going on, but we know we're no better than them. We've got our own idols, right? But he sends him into a very difficult place to be fed by this widow. And he goes and he meets her and she's picking up sticks. And he says, bring me a little water in a vessel that I might drink it. And you know, as I was reading through this, it's a wonder that this, this woman didn't throw the sticks at him and say, are you kidding me? Water for you? We're in a drought. And this would have been a slap in the face to the Israelites reading this at one point because this woman went and fetched the water. And what did Israel do to the prophets? They beat them. They, they killed some of them. And here she is. She goes and fetches the water. And then as she's on her way, as if that wasn't enough, he asked for a morsel of bread. And so at this point, it's when we find out that this woman is in the refining place herself. She's in the smelting place. She tells Elijah she only has enough ingredients to make some food for her and her son a little bit before they die. I mean, think about that. We've got plans for lunch. We may, we may even know what's for supper. Can you imagine taking your family home and opening that cupboard and saying, this is all we have, we're going to make this meal, and then we die? That's where she was. She's going to make food. She said, I only have enough to make for myself and my son before we die. But what does Elijah say? Elijah tells her, he tells her not to fear. He says, for the Lord, the God of Israel, will not allow the flour to be spent, nor the jug of oil to be empty until it rains again upon the earth. And we're told at the end of the passage, in verse 16, that the jar of flour was not spent, and neither did the jug of oil become empty until according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by the prophet Elijah. Y'all, this is not some story about some God way back when. This is a story about our God. The same God that we worship to this day. This is a story about Him who multiplied this oil and, and, and didn't let the water run out. And, and, and we know it. Even though our backs are often against the wall, we know it that every word of the Lord proves true. Brothers and sisters, this is our God. He's the great provider of His people. And, and like I shared in, in the prayer, I don't know everybody's situation here, but I know that you're human. And I know that in this life, in a fallen world, you suffer. We all suffer. If you're not in the refinery now, you have been or you will be. Okay? Oftentimes, God has our backs against the ropes. And as the Apostle Paul said, it oftentimes feels that we have received the sentence of death. But you know why? You know what the Apostle Paul said to that? He said, it, 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 we were put in this situation. We felt as though we had received the sentence of death. Why? So that we could rely on the God who raises the dead. And so look at us. Look at our lives here. Like I said, I don't know everybody, but you're here. Praise God, you're here. How did we get here? How on earth have we made it to this point? The Lord has provided. The Lord has given to us. He has sustained us. He cares for us. And He has plans to use us for His glory and to bring us to Himself. Just like He's using the prophet Elijah here to bring Him glory. And He uses us as His hands and feet to provide for others. Here He provides oil and, and, and water in a jug. I mean, oil and, and this um, uh, flour to make these cakes. And He does it in a supernatural way. And we can sit there and go, Hey, Josh... Yeah, that's great. He made that multiply, but he's never multiplied anything in my cabinet. Has another brother or sister ever provided anything for you? Has, has he not provided through ordinary means in this world? And does he not give to us 
that we could help other people. And so in this way, God uses us as His hands and feet. He provides for us so that we can provide for others. And He uses us to pursue sinners. And so this leads us to the next point. Yahweh is Lord. He's a Lord that pursues sinners. See in verse 17. In verse 17, we see that after, after this son, uh, after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, he became ill. And he became so ill that he died. And so up until this point, we've seen, uh, th- this woman, she's, she's, she's destitute. She doesn't have much. She and her son are about to go die. But now, he precedes her in death. He precedes her in death. And here it's a, uh, we see that she's called the mistress of the house. And this is interesting when you start getting into, a, you know, a phrase like this that, that's new to the, to, to the narrative and you look into it. This word mistress is translated Bela. And elsewhere, when we see it used in the Old Testament, it speaks of a sorceress. And so here we have Elijah in the home of a Baal loving witch. One who had devoted her life to worshiping the God of the storms, she has nothing. To worship the God of fertility, she has a dead son. This woman is in no doubt the lowest point of her life. Her son is dead. And she had helped the prophet. And this is what she gets in return, we can think. This is what she thought. She goes to where we most often go when disaster strikes us. We cry out to God and we say, God, what have I, des- what have I done to deserve this? What have you against me, O oh man of God, that you've come to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son? And the Lord is patient with us in those times when we cry out to Him like Job. But we, 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 this, this woman who's crying out, what have I done to deserve this? What have you against me, O man of God? She doesn't yet know and see what the Lord is doing. She doesn't yet know the words of Psalm 116 that says, I I was brought low and you saved me. Or or Psalm 119, it was good that I was afflicted that I might learn your statutes. Or even in Psalm, uh, I believe it's 32, 32 or 34, where um, we, we see that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and He saves the crushed in spirit. She doesn't yet know this, but she will. And I love what Sinclair Ferguson said to this, this passage at this point. You know, he, and, and this is often what we think about sin. Um, this woman thinks that the death of her son could in some way atone for her sin or is the punishment for her sin. And she didn't yet know that it would be the death of another son that could be the only atonement for her sin. You line us all up in in the whole town, the whole nation, the whole world. All of our deaths could not atone for one sin. She's going to find out. So Elijah, he takes the boy in his arms and he goes into the room and he lays upon the boy and he cries out to God, Lord, bring the boy's life back. Have you sent me to this woman only to take her son away? And we see in verse 22, some of the sweetest words, I think, in all the Scriptures. Words of hope for us who are commanded to pray. It says, and the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah and the life of the child came back into him again and he revived. And don't let these words slip through our ears and past our heart. When we pray, we don't pray to the ceiling. It doesn't just stop there. We pray to the God who hears and He acts on behalf of His people. And we're good Presbyterians. We believe in the sovereignty of God and we believe in God's providence. We've got to remember that God uses means to accomplish His ends. And one of those means is prayer. We see the means of the Gospel in bringing people to to salvation. But here, Elijah cries out and he is heard and the Lord acts. The Lord listened to Elijah. 
And we're reminded in the book of James that Elijah, he, he was a like man. He was like us. He was a human. Yes, he was a prophet. Yes, this is a specific instance here that I, I, I don't think is repeatable in and of itself, but the same principle is there. And James teaches us that. Elijah was a like man, had a like nature to us, and he prayed and the Lord heard. And that's an encouragement for us to pray. So we see that the Lord, He brought this child's uh, life back. And this is where we see God's pursuit, this pursuit of this sinful woman, we see it come to fruition because when she received her son back, can you imagine that? She, she, she's down here probably distressed and weeping. Her son's dead. The prophet takes him up into the chamber. She doesn't know what's going on there. And then he walks down with this living boy. Can you imagine what she felt in that moment? And she responds, she says, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. And the same is true for us today. And I know some of you in here, I've talked to some of you, and I know from my own experience, I've, I've got two children that haven't been raised. You in here, you've lost people that haven't been raised. From the dead. And so we can read this and go, great for that woman, but I've lost someone and I don't have them back. And what we've got to remember is that we're in between, we're in the already and the not yet. And this story here is a foretaste of what each and every one of us in here will get in that last day. Everyone who is dead in Christ will be raised to the glory of God. I promise you that because His word says it. And this is a foretaste of it. You know that that boy went on to die again. When we talk about that, we see people in Scripture who are raised and we think, man, wow, I mean, I was, you know, in a good place and now I'm brought back to the earth and now I'm, you know, it's, 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 it doesn't make sense to our, to our finite minds, but we see the Lord, we see a foretaste of what He has in store for all those in Christ. This woman had given her life to Baal, years of sacrifice for nothing. Baal promised rain and fertility, and the widow got a drought and a dead son. But the Lord had other plans. He had plans to provide for Elijah and this woman. And He had plans to pursue her that she would become a trophy of His grace. And all of this was preparing Elijah for the coming showdown when you get to to, uh, 1 Kings 18. We see this coming showdown where he meets the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel to, to really show who God is. Who's the real God? And if you, I encourage you to go read uh, 1 Kings 18 to see that. But we see that the Lord, He provides for His servants. The Lord pursues sinners. I mean, think, each one of you in here, how did you come to know the Lord? The Lord pursued you through a mother or a father or a grandparent or a vacation Bible school teacher or a preacher. Uh, who, I, don't, I don't know, but I know the, you're here and the Lord pursued you through someone. And so praise the Lord for that. He provides, He pursues, and here, last point, as we'll close out, we see that the Lord, He comes down. He visits His people. Because you know, it's great, as great as these stories are that we read in 1 Kings, and they are, they're great. And as great even as the prophet Elijah, I mean, I think... It, you can, it's okay to look at good examples of someone walking in faith in the Old Testament scriptures and say, I want to follow that example of standing, uh, when, when, I, when Elijah, you know, stands in the face of Ahab, someone who, who is, uh, completely contradicting the word of, or co- trying to contradict the word of God, someone who is opposing the word of God, Elijah stands and he proclaims God's word to him. And so sure, there's, there's things that we can take from his life, but we gotta know that Elijah's not the main point of the Bible. This story is not the main point of the Bible. There's someone greater than Elijah. And we see in Luke's Gospel that Jesus, he uses this same story of Elijah. He uses it to show the Pharisees and the scribes that God seeks and saves Gentiles as well as Israelites. 
See, Jesus, he was, he was in the temple and he, remember when he unrolled the scroll of Isaiah and he turned to Isaiah 61 and he, he reads from that, that passage and he says, today in your hearing, these have been fulfilled. Elijah, I mean, uh, Jesus reads from that passage and says, today in your hearing, these have been fulfilled. And then he reminded the people in the crowd, the Pharisees and the scribes, he said, you remember that story about Elijah? sent to the widow at Zarephath instead of all the widows of Israel? Because they, the Pharisees could not stand Jesus dining with tax collectors and sinners. They did not know that He came to seek and to save the lost. But He uses this story to show them that that's exactly what He had come to do. And when, when uh, Jesus reminded them of Elijah being sent to the widow of Zarephath, what did they want to do to Jesus? They wanted to push Him off a cliff. They were so enraged that they wanted to push him off a cliff. They had a vision of God and what God's Messiah would be like, what he ought to be like. And Jesus shattered their expectations, just like I'm sure he has shattered yours. He continues to shatter ours as we come to the Word, shatter it in a good way. Jesus completely shattered their expectations. He had come to seek and to save the lost. He came to provide life and to pursue sinners and to give His life for our sin. See, Elijah, he brought news that the oil and the flour, that they would not run out. What did Jesus do? He turned water into wine, the best of wine, And he multiplied fish and loaves throughout his ministry. And we don't even know all of what he did. John said if everything had been recorded of what Jesus did, the the world couldn't contain all the books. We've got a few glimpses. Jesus did it in his power. We know that Elijah prayed based on the, the covenant curses in Deuteronomy. Elijah prayed and it stopped raining. What did Jesus do? Jesus stands up in the boat and He commands the wind and the seas to be calmed, and they were. He got out and He walked on water showing that He's the Lord over all things. He is the Lord. Elijah cried out in this this destitute, just, just grim situation with this dead boy, Elijah takes him up and he lays him down on his bed and he, and he lays himself upon the boy and he cries out to God to raise the dead. What did Jesus do? Jesus walked up to a tomb where a man had been dead for days and he said, Lazarus, come out. And he obeyed. I love what Martin Lloyd-Jones says about this. I, I think he, when he was a about 12 years old, he was in the congregation and the preacher asked the question, you know, um, uh, why did he say Lazarus come out? And little Lloyd Jones says, because if he didn't specify, they all would have come out. Ain't that the truth? Everybody's going to come out of that grave in the last day. And so we, like the woman, we know that our sin, it deserves death. And our deaths mixed with all the deaths of all the people who have gone before us and come after us could never pay the debt that we owed. But, but, but we know that Jesus Christ, in coming down and visiting His people, in passing the test in the wilderness, Adam fails the test in the garden, Jesus passes the test in the wilderness. And then we see Jesus going and He's, he's preaching and He's healing, He's casting out demons, He's binding the strong man and He's taking His plunder. Jesus is not only is his death for us, but his life is for us. He lived a perfect, obedient life, spotless life, a righteous life. And then we know that he went to a cross and took our sins upon himself and paid a debt that we owed to God but could not pay. Jesus has provided for us and he has pursued us. And he has visited us, visited us by his Holy Spirit in and through his word. God has provided His Son who lived a perfect life and died a sinner's death in our place that we might be forgiven and counted righteous by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And He has pursued us through His servants. He has provided for us through each other. 
And now we, His ministers of reconciliation, we go out into the world and we can provide for others who are in need and we can pursue sinners with the message of the gospel and be near to them in a time of need as we await that day when Jesus will return. He has redeemed us from our futile ways, our days of worshiping false gods that only took from us. But now we can, with faith and assurance, say that Yahweh is Lord and He is good. So let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank You so much for this Word. Um, we can't, it's difficult to even get up here and to, to, to preach through it because I could never say everything that needs to be said, Lord, but I just pray that we could walk away with a bigger and better picture of You and Your goodness as we see You and, and Your mighty deeds and, and specifically as we see You and what You've done through Your Son, Jesus. So we thank You this morning that we could come as the redeemed ones, and we could worship. And may we go out and glorify You in all that we do. In in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.